Welcome to the Reach Podcast with your pastor, Matt O'Mealy. I am Matt O'Mealy. If I haven't met you yet, uh, please rectify that. That would be uh, in my best interest so I can know you. Uh, I am new. If you're new here also, don't feel bad for not meeting me yet because I'm new. It's been officially slightly over three months that I am here to sort of replace Philip. Philip is still here. He's moving up to older adult ministry, so he is still around to um, keep us all in line, as he always been, uh, has been most of my life since I've known him, uh, keeping me in line as uh, the nerd in Sunday school. And, uh, and here I am uh, now uh, co-working with him, which is fantastic that we get to serve the Lord together at Evergreen. So tonight, what we're doing, like, uh, like, like Taylor said, we are going to be jumping into Romans. You know, I just thought we'd shift gears after Song of Songs for the last five weeks, do something a little different, you know, shake it up. Uh, you guys have been, if you're a part of the College Sunday School, you've been doing Romans, mainly looking at the gospel according to Romans, if you would want to say it that way, just looking at what uh, Paul is laying out in Romans for, um, for, uh, for the gospel. Could you bring me my water? I just cleared my throat, and I was like, ah, I forgot it, because I was so panicked about my, my headset. So looking at uh, the end of Romans, the reason I wanted to look at the end of Romans was that Uh, Philip had started the year off looking at the year of community, understanding that we as a Christian body are called to be together in unity, to live together in community, serving and loving one another. In particular, there is a lot of verses in the New Testament that uh, use phrases like one another, and a whole bunch of those are in Romans, all throughout Romans, and a couple of them are scattered around the end of Romans because this is Paul talking to the Romans. This is kind of his closing statement after he set him straight with a lot of theological things earlier in the book. If you haven't read Romans, it's not too long of a read, but it is a heavy read, uh, but definitely spend some time going through that. But the last few chapters of Romans is Paul laying out his instructions with a whole lot of instructions all at once about how to live in community, how to live in unity with one another. To the Roman church, it is the context of Uh, Gentile believers or non-Jewish believers and Jewish believers that were not getting along. So there's a whole lot of stuff here at the end of the book about reminding them, now that I've set the record straight theologically, you need to get along in these areas. And this is what that looks like. So that's what we're going to be looking at. So with this uh, short series that we're going to do through just the last few chapters of Romans over the next couple of weeks, uh, the chapter and verse breakdowns is kind of where I split the, the sermons apart. And the chapter and verse breakdowns, if you don't know, they came in, you know, hundreds of years after the, the, the majority of the Scripture was written, so it's not, it's not an a, uh, inerrant thing to Scripture, but there's reasons sometimes, the good reasons, that they are split up the way that they are, and so it can be a good exercise to look at a chapter and think, why did the church fathers, you know, 1,500 years ago or whatever, why did they sit down and make chapter 13 chapter 13? So that's what we're going to do tonight, is just look at what is the theme that's going on here, because there's a whole lot of instructions, and they seem kind of separate. As I was talking to Taylor over the last couple of days, it's one of the, a lot of in Romans, you could look at it and, you know, and many people have, I've done it myself, where we we look at just one of these small instructions that might just be three verses and make an entire, you know, sermon about that and just spend an entire day on, on three verses, which I love doing, but also why did Paul write all of 13 the way that it, again, he didn't write it as chapter 13, but why are these instructions all put next to each other in a row? I want to explore that tonight. So we'll be looking at uh, chapter 13 today, and there is a lot of stuff going on in there, but what I specifically want us to see is that Paul is calling Christians, he's calling the brotherhood of believers the Roman, uh, in the Roman church, the, the Jews and the Gentiles, he's calling us to love each other through integrity. Love each other through integrity. And tonight we're going to look at a few different ways that that plays out uh, through chapter 13. So how are we to love each other through integrity is how we will fulfill our obligations to society, how we will f- fulfill our obligations to loving our neighbors and the way that we conduct ourselves both individually and communally as the church. So first of all, what is integrity and how does integrity show love? Integrity can be defined as the practice of being honest and showing a consistent and uncompromising adherence to a strong moral and ethical principles and values. So as a Christ follower, Adhering to strong principles and values in all areas, internal and external, personal and public, 
ethical and spiritual, that's a base level approach to fulfilling the law of loving God and loving people. If you know me, I always go back to that because that is, I mean, Jesus said it was the greatest commandment and we should listen to Jesus. So uh, being able to boil it down to that, this base level approach of having integrity is how we love God and love people, especially because as we're going to see looking at chapter 13 here in Romans, that it's not just a surface level that come uh, of what we do on the outside or the laws that we follow or don't follow, but it comes from a changed heart empowered by the Spirit. So with that in mind, let's look at Romans 13. I know some of you, specifically Richard, uh, has asked me, what do I preach out of? I preach out of the ESV uh, nine times out of ten. So if you got ESV, you'll be good. Uh, so go, go along. Taylor just spent a lot of money on a new ESV, so he's real excited about that. Uh, so yeah, if, in case you need to know for future reference, that's where I generally will be. Uh, I would let you know otherwise if it uh, pertains to a sermon. So Romans 13, starting in verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval." For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, owed respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand, so then cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh, gratifying its desires. So, what is the first thing that we see? It's pretty weird. So, why, why is my first sermon the one coming out saying, hey, pay your taxes? That's weird, right? That was not my intent. That's just, that's just what happened. Verses 1 through 5, Christians love through our integrity as model citizens. To our Western American ears, being subject to governing authority seems out of place in the Bible. But here it is. Paul is calling Christians to be subject to or to obey government because God ordained it. Even in the context of Romans, this is a generalized statement on the basic principle that submission to government is what we are called to do because of our integrity, because of love. But it follows Paul's general call of love that he's been doing for quite a while now, if you read all of Romans, where he started, especially back in chapter 12, because the love of God means loving what God has instituted and loving what God has created, both man, of course, but also the things that God has instituted. instituted. Several places in scripture, though, like Daniel, this truth is pointed out, even in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that the Most High rules the, king, the kingdoms of men and gives it to whom he will and sets it over the lowliest of men. That's from Daniel 4.17. So having this in mind, that God puts those things in place, one commentary puts it this way, that Christians love. That is what we do. It is our entire ethic summed up. Yet, we love not to earn God's love for us, but in reflection of God's love and to be assured of his love. As Paul says in Romans 12, 9 through 10, he says this, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. So I hate to break it to you. I know that hurts. 
but paying our taxes is a form of respect for government. And believers in Christ should have an open and honest and respectful approach to how we interact with the oversights of government that God has instituted. Such an attitude even is exemplified by Jesus Christ, as he says in Matthew 22, 21, he says, therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. A lot of times people want to paint Jesus as a, as a revolutionary that was bucking the system. He was bucking the wrongly done laws of things like the Pharisees, but not the laws of God as found in Holy Scripture, even not the laws of the unjust Roman occupiers that were there. He said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God what is God's. He, he was a revolutionary in the fact that he only ever obeyed God, and he walked that thin line, and that's what we as Christians are called to do. Having this knowledge of this truth, we are to be like my children who are sitting right over there. If you haven't met them, they're over there reading or not reading. They're, they're looking at uh, where's Waldo, because that's awesome, right? <laughs> so we're to be like my children, all children in, in general, but mine specifically, who bear this weight of responsibility of knowing better, like my oldest, Valor, uh, he has to know better than his little brother, or the hooligans he might run around with, whose parents might not hold them to that same expectations that I hold my children, I still expect them to live to a higher level of expectation, I put that heavy burden on my children, and I, and I feel bad about it, but I understand it. That's how my parents were. My parents were, were pretty firm about some of those things. Uh, but I was also the youngest, and, and I definitely got away with some stuff, and I was a bit of a hooligan. So, you know, I feel even worse because I'm, I'm, I'm putting some heavy burdens on him to do that. But it's that idea that, that you, you know better. It doesn't matter what the world is doing, son. <laughs> you know better. We, you know you don't act this way. We don't treat other people Whatever, whatever way. We don't, we don't take things out of other kids' hands and stuff like that. I hold my children to a higher uh, a level of expectation. In the same way as Christians, we know the truth of what God's Word says, so we have to grapple with the reality that as an individual who rebels against authorities is rebelling against what God has instituted, and therefore is rebelling against God himself and is in danger of bringing the civil sword and God's divine judgment on himself, if not now, in eternity. Paul makes this reality obvious in verse 3, saying that the rulers are not a terror to those with good conduct, but to bad, which reveals the blessing that authority actually is, that because civil governments are there, we don't have anarchy. We have examples of anarchy even in Scripture, in the Old Testament. That's what Judges is all about. It's about the anarchy when there was not a, a healthy government when there was not God's instituted government that, that wielded the sword in a consistent and good way, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That is, all over Genesis and Judges and lots of places in the Old Testament, we see anarchy when there isn't good authority structures. But that doesn't mean that Christians simply work to avoid punishment like a toddler who just doesn't want to spank in and wants to get candy at the end of the day or whatever. We are to grow in spiritual maturity, listening to our conscience God's word, the leading of the Holy Spirit, the accountability of the brotherhood, so that we can live rightfully and fulfilling the law of love in all that we do and say. But I hear you complaining in my head. It could just be me. Not all laws are good, right? There are plenty of examples in Scripture where servants have to make, the servants of God have to make that difficult decision to obey God rather than men. That's what the apostles say in Acts 5.29, where they're being told to not preach Jesus. They're saying, ah, we got to obey God rather than men, right? That's an example of it. But the gospel, it does not endorse blind submission to every governmental presence or, or policy that comes our way. This only applies when the government or authorities or whatever is, is trying to force believers to not obey God. So a quick word on the temptation for that. As a, as a person who loves breaking rules that I feel are stupid. <laughs> um, yes, there are biblical precedents for breaking civil laws uh, when it comes to not disobeying God. That's true. But don't be so full of yourself to think that every preference that you have, every conviction that you have, is eternally more important than obeying God's word. 
and you should then force it on other people. We are not the arbiter of God's justice and vengeance. God is, right? It is not our job to wield the sword. It is our job to wield God's word, the sword of the Spirit. Origen said, Origen is the second, third century church father. He says this about this particular conundrum that believers are faced. He says, God will judge us righteously for having abused what he gave us to use for good. Likewise, God's judgment against authorities will be just if they use the powers that they have received according to their ungodliness and not according to God's laws. So, believer, you are to live a cruciform, which means Christ cross-like, a cruciform, Christ-like life, and anything less in these instances is disobedient and it is dishonoring to Christ. Which brings us nicely to verses 6 through 8, that Christians love through our integrity by being honest and generous. Let's look at these verses again. It's been a minute since I've read it. I read a big chunk of scripture. Let's refresh our minds, starting in verse 6. It says, "For." Because of this, you also pay taxes, for authorities are ministers of God, attending this very thing. Pray to all what is, pay to all what is owed. Oh man, I, I was so good at reading it earlier. Now I'm getting all confused. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. And honor to whom honor is owed. Verse eight. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. So in regards to the government, another commentator pointed it out this way. He says that Christians must not refuse to pay taxes simply because they think the money is used unjustly, right? Simply because they think the money would be used unjustly. Think of the first century context that Paul is writing to here. Were the Romans using all of their taxes justly, right? Was Jesus giving the denarius or whatever it was, taken out of the mouth of the fish, you know, to give to Caesars, what is Caesars, all those things that Jesus did with money, was it being, do we know if it was used justly or not? He didn't say, because I'm Jesus and I know everything, I'm going to give this tax to, to Caesar. No, he said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, right? Again, I know there's unjust things in the world, and, and we vote with our money, we vote with our literal votes, you know, USA, uh, but as, as believers, we are not called to be belligerent. We're called to follow Christ in the way that he did things. This got me thinking of other institutions that are populated by fallen humans. This is not too dissimilar to how we are instructed to tithe to the church, also instituted by God and funded through obedient giving, regardless of how we think things are going, right? I've, I have had the displeasure of being around churches who, when people don't like the sermon that's currently going on, they don't tithe that week, right? That is not healthy. That is not how things should go. And in the same way as, because the church is made up of, I, I'm not perfect. You might not like my sermon that's telling you to obey authorities. I definitely would not have liked it <laughs> when I was your age, uh, but that's, this is what God's word says. But as, just as the church is populated by, by fallen humans, sometimes we make missteps. That doesn't mean that we hold back our money or refuse to, to, to love each other temporarily till you appease me, right? In the same way, we give honor to those who are due honor. We give respect to those who are due respect. God established the governments for maintaining rule, for wielding the sword, for preventing tyranny, right? That's the, the ideal, and to execute justice on behalf of the people. And it must be funded somehow, you know, better, better us willingly give our taxes and vote appropriately according to our conscience than to, this, to, to turn into Robin Hood, right? And, and Sheriff of Nottingham coming through and, and, and stealing our money and doing all the things that, that happens in the Robin Hood story. That's, that's where my mind went of thinking of the sheriff going to the, to, to the poor man's cup, and, or which was Robin Hood in the cartoon, and he hits it so hard, all the money flies out and he grabs it all, you know? We would rather pay our taxes appropriately and be as good citizens than to have a, a, a terrible tyranny on top of us. But just as God instituted the governments, he instituted the church for the spreading of the gospel through evangelism, through discipleship, the equipping of the saints, and it also is appropriately funded in its context. That's through our tithes and offerings, both monetarily, but also our resources, our, our time is an offering to God, the way that we not just attend, but the way that we give back and we serve. So on a practical level, remember that Jesus said 
to, in, in regarding our worry of finances and, and our love of money that we are tempted to do, he told us to not worry about those things, right? In Matthew uh, 6, 19 through 34, it talks about not to store up worldly treasures, not to be worried about where we will get food from or what we will drink, because treasures will be destroyed by, by moth and rust. But God clothes the lilies of the field. He feeds the birds of the air. Doesn't he love you more than these things, right? So our worry over our finances and just the mere stuff that we have, it cannot be an excuse or control the way that we pay our taxes as good citizens or tithe and give back to the church as good fellow believers pouring into the community of believers. Remember, remember again Christ's attitude in Matthew twenty two twenty one that therefore we are to render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God's what is God's, right? Taxes and tithes. I know that's that's rough, but. Let's think about it on a broader level. Paul is very shrewd here in the way he, that he tells us to not owe anyone anything. Practically speaking, we're to be socially responsible. But the ultimate thing is that the Christian's relationship to the Mosaic law that Paul is talking about here in Romans is that Christ already fully f- fulfilled everything on our behalf. So we are called to then work that out in our hearts and in our actions by doing what? By fulfilling the law, which is loving God and loving people. So ultimately, what we do with our time, our actions, our literal resources of finances, this is a debt, the way that we love people with them, it is a debt that never ceases to be continually asked of us. But it's, it's a good thing, right? We get to love people. It, it's a calling to be like Christ in the way that we lay down our lives and love other people. This isn't a, a burden. It's not a tax burden. It's not a tithe burden or whatever on our back. We get the opportunity to love God says, I give you everything you need. Don't worry about, you know, where you'll eat or drink or the money you need or whatever, right? I, I, I clothe the lilies of the fields. Why wouldn't I do that to you? But he still decides to give us resources and then calls us to join him in the gospel of reconciliation and use those resources that he gives us to serve and love other people. Just like a good parent, you know, wanting to, to, to buy a Mother's Day present with their little kids, they, they don't have jobs. And so I, I give them money to buy stuff for their mom. But, but they got to do it. That's what we get to do when we use our resources to, to give back, to give to, to what is owed, and to love other people through that. So to dial it in a little bit more closely, to go from those big circles of government and authorities and taxes and all that stuff, let's look more closely. As Christians, we are to love through our integrity by being righteous, looking more at us as individuals, verses 9 through 10. Paul says this, starting in verse 9, For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and other commandments are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So looking at these verses, how are we to be righteous? The vehicle for righteousness as a believer, as a Christ follower, is love. That is the command that we find throughout all of Scripture. It is the summation of the law. Uh, John says this in 1 John 4, 8. He says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And in 4, 16, he says, so we have come to know and to believe that uh, uh, that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Love is not merely an external conformity to the rules. It is the essence of living out the law loving God and loving people. This is practically lived out in verse 10, where God says, love does no wrong to neighbor. Therefore, love is the the fulfillment of the law. Now, a wrong interpretation of that would be to think that it is a spiritual uh, fruit of the Spirit for us to be a part of the get-along gang and to just capitulate to everybody's preferences and, you know, do no wrong by offending no one. That is not what this is saying right? We, we do that insofar as we, o- we are still obeying God. But if, it, if anything that would make us the part of the get-along gang would make us not be obeying God in what we do, what we say, what we uh, endorse through our action or inaction, we would be disobeying God if something was impure, right? Scripture is good, God's word is good. And that's why I wanted to look through the end of Romans because there are so many instructions that just get down to the nitty gritty of just even literally being a good citizen. It is important for us as young adults to know what that looks like, to know that this is a responsibility that we can't just slough off on our parents anymore. We are now supposed to be, if you're a believer, a good citizen. 
regardless of how things might be going around you. We give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God with our integrity what is God's. Only in Christ, though, can a person meet this or any other requirement of the law. Romans 8, 3-4, Paul says this. He says, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk according not to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. That's a whole lot. But what's going on there is that our mindset is not about what our, where our money is going and our taxes because God owns everything and he gives us everything we have. Our heart, our mind is what is going to be on the things of the Spirit. If we know Christ and we walk with Christ, our concern will be on the things of the Spirit and not on the things of this world. Through Christ and the setting of our minds on the things of the Spirit, we are empowered as righteous, good neighbors to love people this way. Verse 10 shows us that we are to do no harm to our neighbor and to love our neighbor as ourself. So there's an action. The, the, the loving your neighbor as yourself, that, that's sometimes hard to do as I, as I raise my own children. We talk about that often, but Paul tells us, what does that look like practically? It says, doing no harm to our neighbor. In that, you're not just passively not sinning against your neighbor. You're actively praying for them, even for your neighbors who might be annoying, <laughs> might be enemies at times. Uh, Christ tells us in Matthew 5, 43 through 48, that we are even to seek their good, seeking the good of our enemies. 1 Corinthians 10, 24, Paul says, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Now, I found a really good quote from Augustine where he kind of, um, it was convicting. I mean, it was, it was a pretty convicting quote about what this looks like. So Augustine was another, another church father. He's, he puts it this way, the rule of love is that one would wish his friend to have all the good things he wants to have himself and should not wish the evils to befall his friend, which he wishes to avoid himself. He shows this benevolence to all men. No evil must be done to any. Love of one's neighbor, of one's neighbor works no evil. Let us then love our enemies as we are commanded if we wish to be truly unconquered. Unconquered by what? Anyone? Any guesses? What was that? Sin. That's right, man. If we wish to be truly unconquered, we will love our neighbors, even our enemies. To fully love our neighbor, including our enemies, it requires a soft heart. It requires being led by the Spirit, having discipline and integrity to love when it is not easy to love. This brings us to the final point. Verses 11 through 14 to the end of chapter 13 says, uh, Christians love through our integrity by being disciplined. Christians love through our integrity by being disciplined. Go ahead and put the, the rest of it up there if you can. There, yeah, yeah, there you go. Those verses too. So Christians love through our integrity by being disciplined. Let's read the rest of the verses here. Well, 11 and 12 it says, the, uh, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to awake or to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and to put on the armor of light. So Paul starts off here by a call to action, to understand the shortness of time that we have before Jesus' second coming. Don't confuse this with some, like, you know, wokeness or whatever. That's not what Paul's saying here. He's saying, wake up. Don't be lazy. Like, time is short. This gives us a picture of a gospel-driven hope that the Lord is returning soon to set things right. So therefore, in the meantime, be about the Lord's work, both in your heart and in your actions. This is, a, this is what Paul was driving at when he talks about the works of darkness. He's contrasting them with the armor of light. And I think this, because my mind is currently in the, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, because I'm studying that for some other sermons, it immediately connected my minds to Jesus calling us to be light in Matthew 5, 16, to let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven, right? So being a disciplined neighbor, loving your neighbor well by putting on this armor of light, it helps them, as Matthew 5, 7, or Matthew 5, 16 says, that you, they would glorify your Father who is in heaven. That is what we are called to do as believers who are good citizens, who are living honestly, who are living with integrity, who are living a disciplined life. So by being disciplined, we contrast then with the world. A Christian should stand out as countercultural in a dark world, and this is done through right actions, 
that we're talking about tonight called integrity. This requires us to be disciplined, to live in that already but not yet state. I'll say that a lot as I preach to you guys, already but not yet. What does that mean? If you're a believer, you are already saved. You already have a, a new heart, a heart of flesh that God has put inside of you. He has removed the heart of stone, and that is already there, but I'm still alive in my physical broken body, so I am not yet fully glorified with a new body, just like how when Jesus rose from the dead and he was still Jesus, he still had a physical body, but people didn't quite recognize him till he interacted with him. He had a glorified new body that was free from the brokenness of the sinful world, right? Not that Jesus had sin, but he was born into the sinful world, right? So in the same way, I live in an already but not yet state. I have to contend with my fallen flesh, right? With my weaknesses, with my hunger, with my tiredness. My tiredness makes me hangry, right? I get grumpy really easily. I have to contend with that, but that requires me to have discipline, to live with integrity and discipline. Since the first century, the church has operated in this mindset that the Lord can return at any moment, and we need to be about his work. We need to live our lives in a way that is effective in spreading the gospel to other people. James 5, 8 says this, you also be patient. Establish your hearts. Establish your hearts, right? This is talking about spiritual things. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Romans 8, 23, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who are the first fruits of the Spirit, so spiritually I am renewed because I have faith in Christ, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, right, to have a new body. So looking here at the language that Paul gives us, he's talking about day and night. What is he talking about? The night is describing the time that we've been in when Christ is absent and Satan is still at work, but the reality that we are in now as a believer, if you believe in Christ, you're in the reality of the exciting, uh, the exciting tension that dawn is approaching. That's the reality we live in. Dawn is approaching, so when Christ returns, all things will be set right. So in the meantime, believer, cast off these behaviors that are characteristic of darkness and sin. Thinking back to Romans 12, if you've been in uh, Taylor's Sunday School, you just finished Romans 12 recently. Romans 12, 1 through 2, Paul says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So a right, holy worship to God is to present our bodies, our physical being, the way we live, the way we act, the way we interact with the world around us, that is how we worship God. Verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, right? There's that contrast of darkness and light. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. See, Jesus pointed this out as well. That people's sin nature loves darkness. In John 3, 19, Jesus says, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. Himself being the light, that people didn't love him because their works were evil. Their minds, their hearts were darkened. And Paul, in verse 13 here, is giving us more examples of what this darkness is that we, as a believer, are freed from. Verse 13, he says, let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. So going back to verse 9, he's talking about some of the commandments that we should not be breaking if we are fully loving our neighbor. We're not murdering, we're not coveting, we're not stealing, right? We're not, we're not committing adultery. Now in verse 13, this is where the rubber meets the road a little bit. This is what it looks like right? We're living with integrity, both with our bodies, physically, sexually, and with our hearts, the way that we interact with those around us. Sin, like crime and violence and wickedness, they are associated with darkness and with the night. As, saying, as the saying goes, nothing good happens after the sun goes down, right? Or after midnight or whatever it is your grandma might have said, some version of that. Even Christ made this distinction, as we were just seeing that in John 8, 12, he says, uh, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life in them, right? So Jesus makes that distinction. There is a dark and a light thing. In the darkness, sin happens. In the darkness, you feel unseen, and you're tempted, as we are living in that already but not yet state, to do what our flesh wants. We don't get to claim any exemption by preaching the truth with a disclaimer of do what I say, not as I do. That is not the Christian life. That is not how we approach the world. That is not how we evangelize. As a parent, I have to model good behavior for my kids. Otherwise, they won't take me seriously, right? In the long run, they'll develop bad habits. 
You guys, you guys know what I'm saying. I can't tell my kids that it's important to eat healthy and to not eat too many sweets when I have a mouthful of cookies, right? I got to practice what I preach. I can't say, do as I say, not as I do, right? So in the same way, as a Christian, I can't claim the scriptures and rebuke brokenness and darkness around me and other people's lives and maintain any sort of credibility if I'm also blatantly disregarding the scriptures in other parts of my life. We have to live with integrity. That's why it's important. We have to live with a righteous life, and not the righteousness doesn't save us. It doesn't keep. It doesn't give us salvation. It doesn't, it doesn't keep us with God, but it is honoring to Jesus. It is something that we are capable of doing because of the Spirit. I think we can draw some lines pretty easily between what Paul is saying at the beginning of chapter 13 to what Paul is saying here at the very end. Honoring the things that need honoring, right? Giving to those what God has established. Ultimately, loving our neighbor as ourself. The overarching antidote that I found in one commentary is pretty good. says that the deeds that dishonor God, uh, the deeds that dishonor God is a union with Christ that overwhelms the sinful tendencies I'm sorry, let me read that again. The deeds, ah, it. the antidote to the deeds that dishonor God. I missed the antidote word. That's the important word. The antidote to the deeds that dishonor God is a union with Christ. That union with Christ, it overwhelms the sinful tendencies by satisfying the soul and filling the lives of God's people with his wonderful expectations, his perfect will, and overcoming power. I know looking at some of these instructions from Paul, it seems like, hey, do these things and don't screw up right? But if you've missed so far where, where Taylor has taken uh, the, the Sunday school class in Romans, you forget the fact that it is, you have a new life in Christ. We have cast off the old things. Paul says in Ephesians, similarly, he puts a word there. He says, to put off your old self, which brings, uh, this is Ephesians 4.22, he says, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and put on your new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So the calling that we have to live as good citizens, to live as good neighbors, to love our neighbors well, right? This, isn't, this is not a burden placed on your back. This is what God has already done and fulfilled and completed through Christ. We are called to put on Christ. So that idea of putting on Christ, that applies to our already but not yet state. I'm in my flesh still, but I can put on, I can clothe myself with Christ, right? I can take on his appearance. I'm wearing a bright yellow shirt, sort of, sort of bright, I don't know. It's a yellow shirt, right? You can see it, it's obvious. So in the same way, I clothe myself with Christ to where his righteousness is obvious through my heart and life. And when I do mess up, as I inevitably will, but I still strive to not, I point to the clothing of Christ that I have, and I say, yeah, but I still have forgiveness through Christ. I, I don't condone sin just because I know I'm weak, but I know that even in spite of my weakness, God loves me, and so that I, as a believer, can still point to Jesus. When I own my brokenness in a humble way, and I use my brokenness to point to Jesus, who fulfilled this perfect law of love in my place, then I do my part. I don't mess that up. I don't, I don't lose any sort of salvation through that. So this empowering love that we have, it allows us to live no longer as slaves to our brokenness, as slaves stuck in the darkness, but we get to walk in the spirit. We get to walk in the light and live as people of the light. Christian, you are to love through your integrity. Even when it comes to how we live in our communities, because God has an interest in order and not chaos. We are to interact with authorities and laws. When we have that opportunity, we are to model Christ in the way we interact. Christ, who was not a lawbreaker. In the way that we live our lives as, as model citizens, it is also dependent on how we love our neighbors through our honesty and our generosity. Just as scripture says uh, that we cannot fulfill God's law while we hate our brother. We cannot be good citizens if we do not love our neighbor. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, as Paul just told us here. And this is shown through our actions of righteous love, fulfilling the law of love. This is the new spirit-led heart that is necessary, especially now, as time is short, as the dawn is breaking, that Christ is coming back to peel back the darkness once and for all, 
So we are required as disciples to walk in integrity and to be disciplined, to turn our hearts away from sin, turn our hearts away from that darkness, the darkness that so easily entangles us, as the author of Hebrews says, and to put on the armor of the Lord as new creations walking in the light. That is the calling that we have, right? We're not being called to be perfect. Jesus already did that. But we are called to live a life that looks like Christ, that is Christ-like. And when we mess up, we point back to the fact that Jesus already paid the price. And I can hang my hat on that truth with full confidence. And through that, he will get honor and glory. So the question is, where are you? Are you walking in the light, actively throwing off the deeds of darkness? Or are you still in these dark, these concepts uh, of darkness? Are you still being tripped up and easily entangled by your flesh? Do these concepts I'm talking about tonight of love and integrity seem foreign and unattainable to you? I pray that you do some, some work with God. I pray that the Spirit is, is pounding your heart with those truths that you can't fix yourself. You can't live up to some of these things, but Jesus already did. And as a good father, he's asking you to come alongside him and to serve the world and love your neighbor in a way that would honor Christ. Hey guys, this is Philip Jackson, pastor of Young Adults at Evergreen Baptist Church. I want to invite you to come to Reach. We meet every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at Evergreen Church in South Tulsa, just east of Mingo on 111th Street. The mission of Reach Tulsa is to cultivate a young adult community that's defined by real transformation and a sincere pursuit of a godly life through training in biblical disciplines, personal development, and intentionally transitioning into independence as mature members of the body of Christ. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to like and subscribe to our content. We're available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Reach Young Adult Ministry is a part of Evergreen Baptist Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. For more information and additional lessons, please visit our website, evergreenbc.org.